All right, everyone. Um, welcome to today's joint ACOM and RAL seminar um, given by Rajesh Kumar from the Research Applications Laboratory here at NCAR. Um, just a little background on Rajesh. He got his PhD from the University of Hamburg and um, held some research fellow and visiting scientist positions in India and Germany before starting as an ASP postdoc here at NCAR. Um, moving on to ACOM and RAL postdocs uh, before finally taking a, a position in RAL. Um, he sponsored a lot of students and visitors in his current position and his research really specializes in blending in situ measurements, satellite and reanalysis data and chemistry and forecast models. And today he's going to give us a presentation that synthesizes these data streams into some actionable science He's going to talk to us about the development of an air quality early warning system for New Delhi. So Rajesh, take it away. Thanks a lot, Nick. Um, as Nick said, um, I'm going to talk about the development of an uh, air quality early warning system for New Delhi. So this is a project that uh, we have done together with the, uh, the Indian Institute of Tropical Metrology. And Sachin Gode, who is listed here, is the lead PI from the IITM on this system. Apart from such in a lot of colleagues from India um, who are listed here, especially Chinmay and Gaurav has contributed significantly to the development of this system. And from NCAR side, uh, Stefano Alessandrini and Mirnal Viswas have been heavily involved um, into the system. So um, just to go back this picture that you see in the background, this is a picture of an air pollution episode that occurred in New Delhi during November 2017. So this is the daytime, this is Kanat place in New Delhi, and you can see that visibility is near zero. And such air pollution episodes have become more and more frequent in the recent years. And this was one of the motivations to develop this system. So in this talk, I will uh, provide a brief overview of air quality problem in Delhi. Uh, the government of India, as well as Delhi government has taken several initiatives to tackle this problem. So I will talk about those briefly. And then um, I will talk in detail about the development of the air quality early warning system. So basically there are three, there have been three major developments in the last three years, and I will talk about each of them. And finally, I will summarize uh, my presentation. So to start with the, the Delhi topography, so to people who do not know where Delhi is, it's located in Northern India. This is where Delhi is. And in this figure, I'm comparing uh, Delhi with other mega cities of India. So you can see that the population of Delhi is about 30, it's just over 30 million people with a population density of about 20,000 people per kilometer square. And there are about 10.26 million vehicles in, in Delhi. So in terms, of, uh, in terms of population, as well as the traffic, Delhi, Delhi exceeds by far the, the numbers in the other cities, although it has slightly lower population density compared to, to Mumbai and uh, um, Mumbai, Kolkata and, and Chennai. If you look more closely into the population density distribution, which is on the right panel here, you can see that there are some pockets in Delhi where the population density exceeds about 67,000 people uh, per, per kilometer square. And it is more on the, on the eastern side of the Yamuna River. So this is the Yamuna River that flows through Delhi. So a lot of people, of course, a lot of people, a lot of human activity leads to a lot of uh, anthropogenic emissions. And this is the spatial distribution of anthropogenic PM2.5 emissions in Delhi. This is annual average, which means that these sources are active throughout the year. Of course, their magnitude will, uh, will uh, vary slightly as we move from one season to the another, but these are mostly uh, active throughout the year. So you can see that here again, the Yamuna River is here on the both sides, you have heavy emissions. You can see those pockets of high population density as well as the, the road network in Delhi. So, but in addition to the emissions from Delhi itself, there are other sources that are hiked a lot in, in media for and, and held responsible for Delhi's air quality problem. One of those sources is the crop residue burning that occurs during spring and fall, especially in the two states, Haryana and Punjab, which are located northwest of Delhi. So this is, uh, this is one snapshot of more disretrieved fire locations 
over northern India, and you can see that uh, this is during the end of October. So right around this period of time, there is a lot of crop residue burning activity that happens. And smoke from these fire activities sometimes travels to New Delhi and leads, contributes to the air quality program in Delhi. Uh, but fires is not the only emission source uh, located outside Delhi. Delhi is also affected frequently by the dust storms, especially during the springtime. Um, we, we, in one study, we were looking at the interstate transport affecting Delhi. And this slide here shows you the percentage contribution of each Indian state to carbon monoxide in the upper panel and black carbon in the lower panel in Delhi during different seasons. The, this, the first panel is winter monsoon, this is spring transition, this is summer monsoon, and this is autumn transition. So as, as one can expect, so Delhi is, is really a little dot on this map because we are, we are looking at entire India. So you can see that we see a higher contribution, of course, from the neighboring states. But what is interesting is that these source receptor relationships, they actually change seasonally. So the, the, for example, Delhi gets the highest contribution from Haryana in yellow um, during the winter monsoon and spring transition, which is April to May. But then as we go into the summer monsoon season, because of the circulation changes, we start to see the monsoon air coming from the Arabian Sea. So there are basically two branches affecting Delhi. One branch that is going from Arabian Sea directly through Rajasthan, Haryana into Delhi. And the another one that is coming from Bay of Bengal along the Indo-Gangetic plain. So you see that the, this Eastern state, the state east to Delhi, which is called Uttar Pradesh, it also has equivalent contribution to CO and black carbon levels in Delhi uh, during the monsoon time. And then uh, these contribution again decrease as we go into the, into the autumn transition season. Just to show you the surface ozone and PM 2.5 seasonal cycles in Delhi, uh, this is a multi-year plot um, going from January 2012 to December 2014. But if you just see here, we have high levels in January, they start to decrease. And then they show kind of a secondary peak in, um, in May, June which is mostly related to the dust storms as well as the crop residue, the springtime crop residue burning. And then we, we get this really sharp peak during the, during the winter and especially also in, in November. And uh, um, from this November is the month from where we sh I showed the, the image from earlier. So the PM 2.5 problem, it's, it's really a very strong winter time problem. Although throughout the year, the PM 2.5 exceeds the National Ambient Air Quality Standard of India as well as the WHO. In case of ozone, um, during winter, as we know that there is not a lot of solar radiation, plus there is a lot of fog in Delhi, which, which, uh, which leads to very low levels of ozone during winter time. Here, black is the observations and the red is, uh, is, is the model simulations that we did for a previous study. But let's just focus on the, on the black color. And you see that during April, May, the ozone is highest um, in Delhi. It decreases because then during the summertime, we have the monsoon season, which brings the, the clean marine air, as well as there is a lot of deep convection that distributes emissions throughout the troposphere. And then there is a secondary peak uh, right around, around October after the monsoon. So the PM 2.5 and ozone problems, they are kind of decoupled uh, slightly, although because PM 2.5 is always, uh, always an issue. So what is this air quality problem during winter time? It's getting severe and severe every year. So there is a, this famous newspaper in India, Indian Express, and they did an analysis of how the number of hospital admissions have been changing as a function of time in Delhi. And you can see that from 2005 to about 2010, it has been nearly constant. And these are the, the respiratory related admissions. And then it has started increasing sharply. And so the doctors, when they, they are getting this record surge of patients with serious respiratory illness, they are prescribing the patients to leave Delhi, which is, which is of course, we know that it's, it's not a solution. And then um, in 2017 itself, this is a picture before COVID. And you can see that the, the players, the cricket players entered the field by wearing masks because the levels of pollutions were so high that the players started vomiting on the field and the, and the match had to be suspended several times during the course of five days to, and, and, and people waited for the air quality to get better. 
there are many other instances like that which leads to the school closures poor visibility so the the air quality problem in delhi is getting severe every year so the government is very serious about it what what are they doing and what they have done so far they are expanding air quality monitoring network in delhi significantly this is uh, a snapshot of the locations of air quality monitoring stations in delhi uh, during 2017 i think there are more than 20 stations here but from 2017 to present day now delhi has more than 50 stations so government has been investing a lot in the monitoring the second thing is the forecasting and i'm going to talk about the forecast in, in more detail we we provide 72 hour air quality forecasts in delhi there is a lot of emphasis on the information dissemination we we gather this data we produce air quality forecast but ultimately they need to get to the public so the information from the air quality monitoring network it is displayed through digital digital boards like this and uh, you can subscribe to the the sms service if you want to get the air quality information there are mobile applications uh, based on the observations as well as the forecast and and also the website i will i will also talk about the website but so the air quality monitoring and forecast it really gives us the information in in near real time or for the short term for the next 3 days so the the government of india has also launched a national clean air program where uh, india aims to reduce the pm 2.5 levels by 20 to 30% uh, by 2024 so there are there are emission mitigation measures that are uh, that are being designed and hopefully implemented to to achieve this target some some preliminary results show that the pm 2.5 in delhi has already been on a decreasing trend so for the because we um, we are heavily involved in the development of this air quality forecasting system actually at present we are using a three domain setup where the 10 kilometer domain is the outermost domain and covers most of northern india the it is at 10 kilometer resolution then um, the second domain is at two kilometer resolution it covers delhi and the surrounding states and then we have a 400 meter domain that is specifically focusing on delhi so to start with when we started the development of this system we just started with these two domains d1 and d2 and we later on added the 400 meter domain because of because we were not able to capture the very acute pm 2.5 episodes with these two domains um, just quickly to show the warf chem configuration, um, this is a table of various physical processes that we use um, in the model. Um, just a quick note that we started with this Bowlack PKE planetary boundary layer scheme, because at that time there was there were several tests performed by the Indian Institute of Tropical Metrology, and they suggested that this scheme works the best for Delhi, um, especially during the winter time. But in the later years, um, especially in since October 2019, this has been changed to MYNN 2.5 uh, scheme. The cumulus parameterization it's it's on only in the 10 kilometer domain, and we don't use it for for the rest of the domain. Um, this list doesn't include the aerosol model, but we use the Gokart aerosol model because of its computational efficiency. So how how does this air quality forecasting system work? Um, we actually uh, we gather all the data sets, um, so specifically the meteorological initial and boundary conditions from GFS, the near real time fire emissions, which comes from our fire inventory from NCAR, vacuum chemical boundary conditions. So these are the three fields that we need to download every day. So this process starts about 5 p.m. Indian Standard Time, and this is because um, because the the satellite overpass the Equa satellite overpass is around 1.30 in the afternoon, and it takes about three hours for that data to be available. So by 5 p.m., all these data sets are available. So we download them. Anthropogenic emissions are pre-prepared, and also the other input data sets that we need to, uh, to run the WARFCAM air quality forecasting system. We use the previous day forecast to provide initial conditions for the chemical variables. The initial conditions for the metrology, are they come from the GFS forecast. So basically, we refresh the meteorology every day, but we keep the chemical state from the previous day. And then we run the, the WARFCAM system 
to generate the background initial conditions and meteorological and chemical boundary conditions. After that, we download the MODIS near, near real-time AOD, and we blend it with the background initial conditions through the GSI data simulation system. We are using the 3 d bar capability of GSI. And then we uh, generate corrected aerosol initial conditions. And these aerosol, these corrected initial conditions, along with the boundary conditions, they are used to generate uh, a 72-hour air quality forecast, which also then um, supplies the initial conditions for the next day. Um, here is just a sanity check of uh, seeing whether our assimilation is working or not, properly or not. So we compare the frequency distribution of MODIS and WARFCAM simulated AOD from the background experiment, which does not assimilate AOD and the assimilation experiment where we assimilate AOD. So the background is in red, um, assimilation experiment is in blue and the observations are in red. So you can see that the, after the assimilation, the distribution of AOD is very close to, to the observed distribution and the mean values are, are very similar. So basically by assimilating, we push the model towards observations um, um, with the assimilation. And this result is, is representative of the crop residue burning period because that's when the, the PM2.5 levels are highest and that was our uh, period of focus during the initial implementation. So we did several sensitivity experiments. Uh, we, had, we, we see that there is a lot of changes in AOD, but we, we do basically five sets of sensitivity experiments to understand the relative importance of MODIS AOD assimilation, the persistent fire, persistent fire emission assumption, and the importance of aerosol radiation interactions in, in our forecasts. Um, and we do all these experiments from 10 October to 19 November 2017. Um, observation network, as I showed before, there are a lot of uh, observation stations being developed uh, or established in Delhi. Um, at the time of our study, we had about uh, 27 stations. And we also applied some quality control on these observations. So we rejected PM2.5 observations less than 10 microgram per meter cube and greater than 1500 microgram per meter cube. There were some random fluctuations in the data. Um, and so what we did is we removed all the single sky spikes corresponding to hourly change of more than 100 micrograms per meter cube. And then we found some stations showed consistently high values like a straight line in time where the value was just 985 micrograms per meter cube for five, six hours. And so we, we treat those as missing values. And then if a station did not have data for 75% of the time over a forecast cycle, that is 54 hours, then we do not include that uh, site in, in our evaluation. Um, this is the, the verification of our different WARFCAM experiments against observations again in black. Red is the background uh, experiment with real fire emissions. So we don't employ the persistent fire emission assumption. So all the experiments here are with the real fire emissions. And then blue is uh, assimilation. Uh, and the green is we assimilate more this AOD, but we do not allow aerosols to affect the radiation. So you can see that the background experiment without assimilation, there is a large underestimation of the observations. Our different shades here represent the standard deviation in uh, observations and model. And the, having the assimilation, plus aerosols affecting the radiation leads to the, to the best forecast in, in this case. So if we just assimilate aerosols and we do not allow the aerosols to feed back to the radiation, we get an improvement, but the, it is less than with the aerosol radiation feedback. So which means that uh, although the major improvement is coming from uh, the assimilation of AOD, but the aerosol radiation interactions are play also playing an important role in increasing the accuracy of forecast in this region. So this is at the 72 hour uh, time scale, the three day forecast that we're doing. Then we look at individual days and here the first day forecast here from 10 October to 20 November, the color coding is the same as was in the, in the previous slide. And so you can see that throughout the whole period, the model was underestimating the observed PM2.5 concentrations. Um, with the assimilation, we do very well in capturing these observed levels, especially when the PM2.5 is less than, say, 200 micrograms per meter cube. 
when the PM 2.5 levels on average, daily average become around 500 micrograms per meter cube. Although we did a significant improvement, if you compare the red line with the blue line, you will notice that there is about 200 micrograms per meter cube increase in PM 2.5, but we are still far from the observations. And we see that in, in all the days of the forecast. So um, another thing here, I also put the experiments with the persistent fire emission assumption, and those are in the dotted line for the red curve and the blue curve. So you can see that they are very similar to each other in, in all the days, which means that the persistent fire emission assumption works fairly well. Um, we know that in, in data simulation, when we do data simulation, we just constrain the initial condition, then we let the forecast run. And so with time, the errors and biases in the model take over the impact of initial conditions. And we see a slight decrease in the reduction of mean bias as we go from day one to day three. So on the day first, we were able to reduce the mean bias by 86%, and, uh, but still we have a significant if advantage from data simulation as we reduce mean bias by about 70% on day three. So <clears throat> we increase the aerosols in the model. And of course, uh, as, I, as I show that aerosol radiation interactions have a, an important influence, so they have an important influence, not only on the PM 2.5 forecast, but also on the weather forecast. So here I'm showing, comparing the, the first, second, and third day temperature forecast in India. And you can see that the blue line is closer to the black line compared to the red or green line. So the red is even slightly better than the green line, which means that having some kind of aerosols can improve the, aeros the temperature forecast slightly. Another interesting thing that we noticed is that um, the improvements in temperature forecast were not consistent with improvements in the air quality forecast. Here we have the highest improvement or reduction in mean bias on the second day, where we reduced the, the mean bias by, by about 30%. And this, is, this was the period when we had this uh, peak uh, air pollution episode. So before that, like here, the predicted temperature matches very well with the observations. But when we went into that very peak period, where we were still underestimating PM 2.5 by a large amount, we still have an overestimation of forecast. So aerosol radiation interactions, they are, they are very useful, not only for the air quality forecast, but also for the temperature forecast. And this is uh, just an, uh, a figure showing the decrease in downward reaching solar radiation at the surface and planetary boundary layer height. So remember that this is Punjab here where most of the biomass burning emissions occur. And so we see the highest decrease in both the solar radiation and the planetary boundary layer height over these regions. So on average for the month that we analyzed, there is about 100 watts per meter square of reduction in the downward solar radiation. And there is about um, 500 meter reduction in the PBL height, which then helps the emissions to accumulate more in the, in the boundary layer. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we did all these experiments in 2018. But, and because we had to go operational in October 2018. And uh, we, uh, we went operational on 10 October 2018. And this is one of the products that we put on our website. And I will show a link to the website later. Um, so here we, we show the maps. And these maps are color coded in such a way that if you see the green color, then uh, it means the PM 2.5 is below the national ambient air quality standard. If you see yellow, orange, or red, it means that we are violating the standard. And on the right side, you see the time series of PM 2.5 mass concentration in Delhi, and it is averaged over all the grid boxes in this square. So at 10 kilometer resolution, we have about nine grid boxes um, in this area. Crop residue burning, as I said, is an important uh, influence on air quality forecasts. And so we also provide the the animations of the crop residue burning influence. So we do that through a CO fire tracer, which means that we are tracking CO emitted by, by fires and just display the spatial distribution as well as the time series for, um, for CO fire. So when we were doing the testing, we thought that 500 PPV could be the maximum scale that we might need to display it. But then as soon as we went operational, we, it surprised us by exceeding, exceeding that level. This is the information dissemination system website. 
that we have put together. So you can go on this website. Um, if you go to the website, you will see that this, uh, this is an animation of the air quality forecast that you can see. You can click this button and go to the observations. And this is forecast. So this is for more advanced users uh, who like to see the near real time verification of our forecast information about different CO tracers um, and, and different pollutants. Then, all right, so we, we make the air quality forecast. How does it affect the decision making? So um, here I'm showing the evaluation of PM2.5 um, average mass concentrations in Delhi against the CPCB observations. And you see here in blue, we have the observations now and in red, we have the forecast. So what we do is uh, we capture the crop residue burning influence, the general influence fairly well in the model. And then we fail on one day and we fail badly. And so we found out that this, this failure was related to the pre-Diwali traffic jam. Diwali is the largest festival in India. So people, people go back from Delhi to their hometowns. So there was large traffic congestions, which we were not able to, to capture in our model. But then after three days, we had Diwali. So you see this highest peak here, this highest peak corresponds to the, to the night of the Diwali festival. And so we anticipated that there are going to be a large number of increase in, in the emissions from, especially from the firecracker activities. So everybody burns firecrackers. So what we did is in addition to our standard forecast, which is in red, we also ran another forecast um, where we increase anthropogenic emissions in Delhi and all the surrounding states by a factor of two. And that forecast is shown in, in green. So this tells us um, one thing that even a doubling of anthropogenic emissions in Delhi is not sufficient to account for the, for the emissions from the firecracker activity. So in, after that year, we have been trying different things, increasing the emissions by five times, four times, three times, just to see if we can just match this peak um, with the, with the amount of firecracker emissions. So, but we, we need to better quantify those uh, emissions because of those activities. So uh, this is the, the Diwali period. So, but after Diwali period, um, we captured this increase in PM2.5 very well. And this is something that happens every year. So if you look at multi-year time series of PM2.5, just from the observations after each Diwali, you get really stagnant conditions. And, and I believe that the firecracker emissions play a big role in that, uh, but we still have to, to do some analysis and, and experiments to, to study that. But after that, uh, we noticed something interesting. Before this time period, our forecast is all, always underestimating the observations, which made sense to us because we, we do not have nitrate and secondary organic aerosol formation in the model. But then after that, we started overestimating. So I called Sachin and asked him what happened. And then he told me that because the forecast was showing a continuous increase in PM2.5, the decision makers decided to put a ban on trucks and construction activities. And this in fact was, was covered in, in the Times of India, which is a leading newspaper in India. So although the, the forecast, these have errors and biases, but they are capable of producing the tendencies in the, in the trend of air pollution. And that can be sometimes useful uh, for, for the decision-making activity. All right, so we were doing the forecast at 10 kilometer and two kilometer resolution. Uh, but then as I showed before, we were not able to capture these really high peaks. So the Central Pollution Control Board asked us, can we go down to a higher resolution? And uh, the biggest challenge, as you may know, in going down to finer resolution is that you need emissions at that resolution. So fortunately, uh, the Indian Institute of Tropical Metrology has been developing a, an emission inventory at 400 meter resolution. So we decided to go down to that resolution, but it was developed uh, in 2013. So we had to do several sensitivity experiments to optimize these high resolution emissions. And we ended up, we, in the end, we decided to do a 40% reduction of, the, of that high resolution emission inventory. Then um, because we are going down to 400 meter resolution, the satellite retrievals, which are available at 10 kilometer resolution at that time. Now we also have a satellite product at one kilometer resolution. We, we, couldn't, we cannot constrain the air quality, the aerosol initial condition with the satellite data. So we also decided to um, assimilate the surface based observations in the 400 meter domain. 
But then we ran into another minor technical issues. GSI, which is developed here, it assumed that PM2.5 concentrations greater than 150 microgram per meter cube are outliers and rejected those observations. So required a bit of modification of the GSI code to handle acute situations like we encounter in media. And then the, finally, the model runtime, 400 meter runs, they are very expensive. So 72 hour forecast, it takes about eight hours. So what we do is um, we do not run all the domains in parallel at the same time. We run the 10 kilometer and two kilometer domain first so that the decision makers at least have some uh, information to get a first insight into the decision that they need to make. And they can refine that information when we when the 400 meter run is available. So this runs uh, separately and we, we do that through and down capability of work. Um, just some great, uh, some information about the 400 meter forecast and Tinmay is the lead um, on this. You can see this, uh, this is the PM 2.5 distribution uh, for one day. Um, I think I said most of it, so I will go to the next slide. This is the impact of surface observation assimilation. So there are, um, as you can see that now, we are already in 2019, the number of stations have gone from 25 to 40, uh, 43. Um, for the assimilation purpose, what we do is we average all the observations within a particular grid to make a super observations instead of doing an observation thinning. And here um, we show the, the impact of surface assimilation. So black is observation, blue is work and prediction with assimilation and red is without assimilation. So the surface assimilation also <clears throat> help significantly um, in improving the initial conditions. Now we were we started with the Edgar HTAP emission inventory at 10 kilometer resolution, um, and Suffer only covered uh, the 10 kilometer resolution. So, but then we did some experiments and we found that with the Edgar by using Edgar at 10 kilometer resolution, we we were being very low. Although the model was kind of predicting the increase in PM 2.5 but we were very low compared to the observations. So what we did is we also upscaled suffer from 400 meter resolution to 10 kilometer resolution. And that then started providing uh, as good results uh, as, as the 400 meter resolution simulations were providing us. So it's, 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 this shows us the importance of local knowledge, the, the importance of uh, developing local emission inventories. We can start with the, global emission inventories, but there must always be efforts to, to develop emissions at the local scale. Then we said, okay, our forecasts, they look good. You look at the time series, you look at the maps, and then you say that, okay, when the observation is increasing, I'm increasing, when they are decreasing, I'm going down, but can we quantify how good is, a, how good is our forecast? And so we look at several metrics. We look at fractional bias and fractional error. And if the fractional bias is less than 15% and fractional error is less than 35%, then we say that uh, the performance is excellent. And then similarly, we call it like, okay, it is good, it is considered average, or is it, uh, uh, there are fundamental problems in, in the modeling system. So we look at PM 2.5 hourly, daily, as well as AQI index. And based on this table, we conclude that performance is good for hourly PM 2.5 prediction. It is excellent for daily mean PM 2.5 and hourly AQI. And uh, performance does not degrade significantly from day one to day three. Similarly, this is the, the same table for, uh, for air quality index, but now for different categories, because we know that these, the, the air pollution episodes with the highest PM 2.5 levels, they are the most dangerous. So we did a, an evaluation for very poor and severe categories. And we found uh, the, the performance for very poor AQI categories was excellent for all days. Um, it is excellent for the severe AQI category for day one and good for day two and day three. So the mean bias for severe category is more uh, indicating that it's indicating the severe events are still being underestimated by about 14% on day one and 20% on day three. Yeah, so then, so we, we, that was our second step. We went to 400 meter resolution. So air quality decision makers, especially from the Central Pollution Control Board, they found our air quality forecast helpful, but they, this does not tell them what emission sources 
sources they should control. So this is a graded response action plan that has been developed for Delhi for different AQI categories. And you can see the actions here. So these actions are dependent on region. Like for example, if it is in severe plus category, then they stop truck traffic entry in Delhi, stop construction activities, introduce OD1 scheme, potentially close the schools. For severe category, close brick lanes, hot mix plants, stone crushers. But they also want to know like where these sources are located. So the Central Pollution Control Board asked us to develop a decision support system. And decision support system, it really requires, um, requires a developing a source attribution system in the model. And as we know that it is very difficult to do that for, for secondary species that are produced in the atmosphere, be it ozone or secondary aerosols. So um, it's, it's very, this can be done, but computationally, this is very challenging. So we said, okay, we will develop a decision. We will start with a decision support system with the species that are emitted in the atmosphere of course, OC also has a secondary component, but here we just focus on the primary emissions and we just track their transport and uh, dispersion in the atmosphere. So we have come up with a decision support system that provides us information about the different species contributing to PM 2.5, different scenarios. Like if you reduce emissions from a particular sector by 20 or 40%, what will be the impact on PM 2.5, different sectors, from Delhi, the transport industries, energy, waste burning, residential construction, road dust, others and biomass burning, which is of course occurring outside Delhi. And then the districts. So Delhi is here, all these are districts around Delhi. So we track each of them separately into our decision support system. But we have, uh, <clears throat> here is just the methodology. Um, we, you, we implement these as tracers in the system. So we use CO, BC, OC, and P25, which actually represents uh, PM2.5, primary PM2.5 other than OC and BC. So for a regular species uh, in the model, it undergoes all the processes, including emissions, result scale transport, convective transport, interacts with the radiation, experiences chemistry, aging, and dry and wet deposition. When we implement the tracers, they undergo all these processes, but they do not interact with the radiation because we don't want them to, to affect our atmospheric physics. They undergo aging, but they do not affect the chemical state of the model. And because here we are using just few components of PM2.5 to get some insights into the source attribution of PM2.5, we first check whether there is any correlation between PM2.5 and OC plus PC. So you can see that for, for case, in case of Delhi, we see a strong positive relation, linear relationship between PM2.5 and OCPC which gives us confidence that we can use these tracers for the decision support system. So this is uh, the website of our decision support system. It has, it, has been, it has gone public very, very recently. And you can see the, this is the example from, um, from 23 October, because that's the day I was making my presentation. And so I'm gonna play a movie. So you will see that the percentage contribution, this is the color code here, this will change as the movie will progress. Another thing is that uh, we also put the contribution of other regions in terms of percentage to Delhi, and also the contribution of biomass burning to Delhi. On here, we also present the current AQI based on observations, and also the forecast AQI that is coming out of our models. Uh, you can also see the current weather conditions at Delhi, and there is also a bulletin that kind of summarizes uh, these forecasts. So you can see that the, the contribution of local emissions in Delhi is increasing, but you also notice a shift in the districts that are affecting Delhi. So it's, it's a very, very challenging problem. Um, different districts around Delhi have effect on Delhi at different times of the day, which makes it very challenging to put some controls on the emission sources in the nearby districts. Of course, the, the local emissions most of the times dominate, uh, but there are times when the, the local, the transboundary condition, the contribution exceeds the local contributions uh, to, to PM2.5 in Delhi. Um, in addition to this, we also kind of provide these maps on the website, which shows district-wise contributions uh, to PM2.5 in Delhi. 
So blue color is Delhi itself, and then all the other colors represent other districts. And you can see that, say for example, if you follow the follow the green, which is uh, Gautam Buddha Nagar, or this is sorry, this is light green. So this is Jhajjar, which is just west of Delhi. It seems the most important contributor at first, but then it's um, it, it changes significantly. So so these um, transboundary can be. Um, contributions, they change depending on how the metrology changes. We also provide sector-wise contribution maps to PM2.5 in Delhi. Again, here you can see that transport, which is in blue, and energy uh, industries, which is in kind of dark yellow, they, uh, they represent the most important sources um, in Delhi. And then emission scenarios. Um, we also look at emission scenarios, like you can go to the website and really, it's a really cool tool to play with, and you can see you can turn on and off. You just have to do it with a click, and then the the source of the fractional improvement in air quality. This graphic will change. So yeah, that's all. Um, air quality it's a it's a very severe problem for Delhi. Um, the government has taken several steps to combat this problem. Um, we have been fortunate enough to contribute to the development of the air quality forecasting system. Which has been um, which has been found useful for for the decision making activities. So with with that, I'll like to thank you for your attention and take any questions. All right, um, thanks, Rajesh. We've already got a question up on um, on Slido. Uh, from Helen asking, um, do you see the, <clears throat> there you go. Thanks for the great talk. Do you see the Diwali traffic and firecracker PM 2.5 peaks in hindcast mode with modus assimilation? Yeah, good question, Helen. Um, we don't see it, mostly because the, the modus overpass time, you know that it's 1.30 p.m. And both the firecracker activity and the traffic activity, they were mostly in the evening. So it was after the modis overpass time. But you see that um, the next day after the assimilation, we start to see the impact because the aerosols are still in the atmosphere and they appear the next day in the modis retrieval. And we see a better accuracy of forecast the next day compared to the either the Diwali day itself or the fire, firecracker day itself. Give it a second for anyone else's um, questions to show up on Slido. So remember, um, just below the video stream, you can ask your questions. Um, it'll go through moderation, and then it'll show up here. Um, I'll give it another few seconds, and then I can. I've got a. I got a question. Oh, all right, <clears throat> Mary. Uh, Rajesh, nice talk. Most of your, most of your, much of your presentation focused on PM 2.5 in winter. Has there been an evaluation of ozone forecast for periods like pre-monsoon? Um, so, Mary, um, yes. It, it, so, PM 2.5 has been the pollutant of focus in Delhi because the, the, the levels go so high. Um, and now we have this, uh, the whole PM 2.5 evaluation system in place. Um, Sachin's group is now moving to other species. So they have plans to evaluate not only ozone, but also the precursor species. So it's uh, from the decision-making, from the CPCB perspective, they see PM 2.5 as the largest problem. And uh, that's where our focus has been so far. But ozone has not been, we, we have not forgotten about ozone. It's, it's on our list. Maybe hopefully in a year or so, we, we have more information about the ozone performance. Um, I'll ask a question. If there's a Go ahead, Nick. So, okay. Um, this is more like a question about AQI forecasting in general. Um, is there, I'm thinking like, is there a weather and emissions feedback that could be implemented maybe through something like machine learning to extend the forecast prediction windows? Because what I'm imagining is like the forecast predicts it will be warm, but not too warm and sunny. Hence, people will want to get out and travel and things. So I'm wondering if there's any thoughts about that in AQI forecasting at all right now. 
Yeah, I think it's it's a great idea. I Means um, especially for not only for the air quality forecast models, but also for the weather forecasting models. We need to represent this relationship between chemistry and metrology um, in 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 both our numerical weather predictions and um, and aerosol prediction. So sorry, the um, in the air quality predictions. So um, <clears throat> machine learning could be very useful, but we have to see if the machine learning would be able to um, to reproduce those relationships. So that is still to be to be done. But since we are speaking of machine learning, we are trying the machine learning approach for the source attribution system, the decision support system. As you can see in in our current setup, we are tracking a few species that are primarily emitted in the atmosphere and providing qualitative information uh, about decision support system. So we have done some analysis with CISL um, on, on whether we can use machine learning as a function and to predict ozone and PM 2.5 as a function of C and ozone tracers. And the uh, preliminary results are really encouraging. So we are looking forward towards, towards that. Great, there's a question um, from Helen. Um, have you considered using the new GEMS data that would give hourly aerosol optical depth, et cetera? Yeah. Helen, it will be really interesting. We have not tried that yet, uh, but but we would like to try it um, as as it. I think it's available now. We just we, we need to get in touch with the with the gems science team to get access to the hourly AOD data. But this is something that would be I think would be very useful, especially for capturing those uh, those morning and uh, evening rush hour peaks that we see in Delhi. Um, in, in different aerosol components, but we have not done it yet. Uh, question from Marina. Um, what ground-based observations of carbon are available to support attributions of the pollution sources? Um, so the, the, we have the in-situ observation monitoring network. It includes uh, CO measurements. Uh, from the ground-based sites, and that's what we will use. If there's any more questions, um, please make sure to get them submitted through Slido. Um, we'll take maybe another minute after the last question, just to wait to see if anyone else has any they'd like to ask. Sounds good. All right, I'll start last call here, maybe another 15 seconds. All right, if not, um, I wanna thank everyone for attending this joint seminar. I wanna thank Rajesh for giving us a great presentation. Rajesh, thank you very much. Thank you.